Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. We are thrilled to have you joining us today for our conversation. Uh, today, our conversation is entitled Building Your Facilitator Toolbox, Honing Dialogue Skills to Navigate Pre- and Post-Election Tension. So hopefully this should be a very timely conversation for all of us. My name is Bridget Dwyer. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion in Campus Life at Princeton University. I am also the Vice Chair of the Difficult Dialogues National Resource Center. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar and to provide some brief remarks on behalf of my colleagues at Princeton and on behalf of my colleagues at the Difficult, at the Difficult Dialogue National Resource Center. So today I'm gonna to start with a deep breath and, um, and acknowledging what is going on in the world today. So every day there is a lot going on, but today I feel the need to really bring this conversation closer to home. While I work at Princeton University, which is located in New Jersey, I actually live in the state of Pennsylvania. And I live about 25 minutes from where Walter Wallace, a black man, a father, a brother, a community member was shot and killed yesterday in front of his mother and his sister. The story has become all too common and I am simultaneously horrified, filled with grief, not shocked and numb. So I think about this event in particular in tandem with a viral video that was posted on October 25th, just two days ago, two days ago. And that video was of voters, black voters dancing while waiting in line to vote. I first watched the video on Mashable and the caption read, <clears throat> this video of dancing Philadelphian voters will make you believe in democracy. This is the world we live in. And this is what we are holding. We have events that give us tremendous joy and hope and those that snap us back into worry and despair. It is with these tensions and these emotions that we are engaging in this conversation today about having pre-election conversations and post-election conversations. And this question before us is how do we hold and navigate this reality? The reality of racism and violence and wildfires, and hurricanes, of bringing new lives into the world and sending people off to the ancestors one of COVID-19 health and safety concerns, online school, in-person school, productivity at work, and so, so much more. And with all of this, how can we have this conversation about pre and post-election conversations? This is what we're going to do today. So hang in with us. But with this, as we enter into this conversation, just like we started last month, I would like us to start with just a breath just to take about 15 seconds to center ourselves. We are all running and moving around from place to place, place to place. And it's, let's just take a moment to think about where we are, think about your breath or think about nothing at all. So thank you for that. And thank you for making the time today for yourselves. This is time for you. This is an op opportunity for you to listen, to learn, and to gauge with our panelists and really with each other. It is our, is, it is our time. And so please, I, thank you. Please and thank you. Please enjoy it and thank you for joining us. So I'd like to move on to our logistics at this point. So this webinar is sponsored by the Difficult Dialogues National Resource Center, otherwise known as the DDNRC, Princeton University, and Washington University in St. Louis. And so I want to give tremendous thanks to everyone who has worked really hard to make today's program possible. Certainly it would not be possible without the DDNRC's board and, and staff, so thank you. Washington University and all those from the Center for Diversity and Inclusion who worked hard to make the event happen the Campus Conversations on Identity Initiative at Princeton University, the Tiger Well Initiative at Princeton. This is our initiative on health and well-being. The Office of Institutional Diversity and Equity. Our partners on the communication team 
and those uh, across across the country at our, our partner institutions who have pushed this event through and really made this happen. Before I turn this over to Mark Kimimura Jimenez, who will provide a welcome from Washington University, I want to, and, and he will also in introduce our panelists. I want to tell you a little bit more about the DDNRC for those of you who are new to our webinar series. So the DDNRC works to advance in innovative practices in higher education that promote transformative dialogue on controversial topics about in complex social issues in order to strengthen our society. More than ever, our nation is in critical need of tools and capacity for engaging with one another. The DDNRC is committed to the advancement of difficult dialogues, teaching and learning, and the role that higher education plays in this process. So today's conversation is the third in the series that we've been having. And following this conversation, we are going to pause. We're gonna see what the world brings us. And if there are issues, if there are topics that you would like to see discussed, uh, we may regroup in, in February or sometime in the new year and, and think about offering another series. But uh, please be in touch. Please be, go to our website, let us know if there are particular topics that you would like to see. You can also reach out to me personally at Princeton um, and I'd be happy to uh, see what we can do to further um, these important and difficult conversations. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Mark Kimimura Jimenez, who will provide a welcome from Washington University and introduce our participants. Thank you, Bridget. And thank you all for joining us on behalf of um, Washington University and the Center for uh, Diversity and Inclusion. I am excited to join Princeton in this work and the DDNRC as a member of their board and uh, committed to this work. You know, in preparation for today, I looked on my shelf and saw a now tattered 1995 report from the AAC and U called The Drama of Diversity and Democracy, Higher Education and American Commitments. I pulled it out and it was falling apart, uh, but I opened it up to the page that I, I supposedly, I, I supposedly have opened many times. Um, and, and when I looked in it, I thought to myself, drama, uh, you don't even know the half of it and what has become over the last 25 years and where we're at today. But I was reminded of why I kept it on my shelf. It's because I have to reflect on the past and also think about where we are today. In 1916, John Dewey described democracy as the most, most ethical aspiration conceived by human communities. He further asserts it is unattainable without a society's commitment to a lifelong education. It reminded me of a quote from Patricia Williams, keynote at Ash in 2018. She said, we must be forgiving of each other because we are all learning each other. We struggle and offend each other because we don't know each other. We must expand our practices of knowing each other. We have to practice talking to each other we have to practice taking time with one another and understanding that the drama of diversity and democracy emerges because we refused to do those things. In 1995, Lee Nickel writes in the foreword of David Bohm on dialogue, the emergent friction between contrasting values is at the heart of dialogue and that it allows the participants to notice the assumptions that are active in the group, including one's own personal assumptions. Recognizing the power of these assumptions and attending to their virus-like nature may lead to a new understanding of the fragmentary and self-destructive nature of many of, our, many of our own thought processes. With such understanding, defensive posturing can diminish and a quality of natural warmth and fellowship can infuse the group. In my tradition, the history of our family has been passed down, not as a linear story written in a book or told through a DNA test, but as a dialogue. Over 40 years now, I continue to hear stories of our past. As I hit different milestones in my life, I, I, learn, I earn access to these new stories. And as my elders hit different milestones in theirs, they gift me their stories. 
In each of these instances, I have learned that milestones are not about age, but experience. And all along the way, I'm asking questions to learn and understand a time in a world that I did not experience. While we share the same blood, skin, and culture, we share a different context. I share this with you today because understanding who I am, my place in the world, and how I interact with it has been developed because of dialogue. So for today, as I get the privilege to introduce our incredible panelists, I ask that you find through this session what Maxine Green describes as spaces of dialogue and possibility through the stories you will hear and the skills they will share from their experiences. Our three panelists uh, I will start with is Libby Roderick, who is the director of the Difficult Dialogues Initiative at the University of Alaska, Anchorage, and on the board of the Difficult Dialogues National Resource Center. She is co-author and editor of many books and articles and works with faculty across the US and in South Africa to increase their capacity to effectively conduct difficult dialogues and apply indigenous ways of teaching and learning. Libby is also an internationally recognized singer and songwriter whose music has been played on Mars, on national media and around the world. Roger Fisher is a native Detroiter attending both undergraduate and graduate school at the University of Michigan and has served in several capacities at the University of Michigan since, since then and in roles including Associate Director of the Office of Student Activities and Leadership and Inter Interim Director of the Office of Multi-Ethnic multi Student Affairs and in his current position is Associate Director of the program on intergroup relations also at U of M. He teaches, provides administrative leadership, and manages K-12 outreach for the social justice education program. As a student affairs professional and social justice educator, he is committed to liberatory practices in education. Outside of U of M, Roger has served on the board of several nonprofit and community-based organizations. His dedication to community and human service and development extends to, to his role as an ordained minister in his faith community. For leisure and joy, he enjoys reading and listening to all things Motown. Erica Duguay is a senior at Princeton pursuing a BA degree in African American studies, specializing in the race and public policy track with minors in ethnographic studies, French language and culture, and gender and sexuality studies. Having moved around a lot growing up, Erica calls Washington DC home. Her research interests currently lie at the intersection of black studies, women's studies, queer studies, and the history and contemporary practices of policing and police adjacent bodies. Erica is invigorated by opportunities to center the stories of black women trans and non-trans, and all black gender non-conforming and non-binary people who are often erased from the narrative around police and state violence in the US, France, and globally. At Princeton, Erica serves as a peer educator for the University Center for Diversity and, in Cult and Cultural Understanding, facilitating conversations in diff different campus spaces around equity, anti-racism, and general liberation practices. A first year orientation leader for the Dialogue and Difference in Action program, a member of a member and former committee leader of Princeton's Prison Abolition Education and Reform Group, vice president of her dance company, and a campus tour guide, among many, many other things. An incredible panel, and I look forward to hearing from all of you. I'll pass it back to Bridget. Thanks so much, Mark. You all are in for a treat. Listen to all that these folks have accomplished. It is so exciting um, to be able to spend time with all of you. It is uh, always a treat and a pleasure um, to hear your inspirational words and to uh, for you to spit gems to all of us. So we look forward to this conversation. So with that, let's get started. 
Um, you know, Mark gave your wonderful introductions and your bios. And I'd like to, you know, hear from your own voices. Put us in, put it in your own words. Tell us more about who you are and how you are connected to, to dialogue um, and dialogue work. So Erica, would you start us off? Sure thing. <laughs> um, okay, hi everybody. I'm Erica. Um, I use she, her, hers pronouns. And Mark kind of summed it all up. But in terms of dialogue work, I am a first year orientation leader for a program called Dialogue and Difference in Action, um, which began my first year when I was coming into Princeton and I've been a student leader for it every year since. And essentially the program is a week long retreat. Every first year does a program of some sort. And this one specifically focuses on um, having the students kind of come together and think very critically about dialogue, difference, diversity, the big Ds, um, power and privilege as it works in society, as it works in their lives, as it's gonna operate at Princeton, um, thinking about the way that they move in the world relative to others and how their different intersecting identities both hold spaces of privilege and spaces of marginalization. Um, and they just kind of like jump into that uh, both feet first and spend a lot of time both in large groups and small groups working through these different like dynamics and conversations that a lot of them, like definitely myself included, didn't really have the opportunity to engage in prior to Princeton. Um, and that was kind of like my very, or that was my very first orienting experience to the university and has drastically shaped everything I've done at Princeton since. And means a lot to me that I was given the opportunity to like have access to that language, that entire like framework um, of understanding the world. And so it's one of the most important things to me. And I do that every year at Princeton as a student leader. That means I kind of take those small groups and help facilitate those conversations. Um, which brings up a lot of different raw like <laughs> conversations um, as you're in that transitional space from high school or whatever you're doing previously to coming into Princeton. Um, and so I do that at the beginning of each school year. And then on a regular basis throughout the school year, I am a fields fellow. So that's a peer educator for our diversity center, which means that myself and all the other fields fellows, we facilitate conversations in different campus spaces, um, whether that be student groups, um, our eating clubs, which is a bit like our Greek life on campus, uh, sports teams, conversations with faculty, different like eating spaces and collective, like different collectives on campus. Um, we help facilitate those conversations around the experiences of BIPOC students in those spaces and the different ways in which students have often been pushed out of really hegemonic spaces um, and like either create programming for them or facilitate conversations that they're already having. Uh, and we do that on a regular basis, kind of wanes and like ebbs and flows depending on what's happening on campus and what's happening in the world. Um, but since we've been in quarantine and since we've been home, we've been doing a lot of healing spaces, a lot of conversation spaces focused specifically on different affinity groups, um, different like highlights of 2020 um, and just helping people a lot. do that. Yeah. yeah, a lot of different things. Yeah. So that's me. Well, thank you. Thank you. And, and um, actually, Erica, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to circle back to you on that question, but let me give a chance to, uh, for Libby and then Roger to weigh in as well. Go ahead, Libby. Hi, everybody. I'm Libby Roderick, um, the director of the Difficult Dialogues Initiative at the University of Alaska Anchorage. Uh, I come to you from the traditional sacred and unceded homelands of the Denaina people. We have about seven major indigenous nations up here where I come from. And um, they have a very deep and long dialogue tradition of their own that has been critical to my work. Um, so mostly in my capacity, I work with faculty, as was mentioned earlier, um, on campuses in Alaska, in the US, and to a certain extent, um, helping the folks in South Africa in one of their universities. And the focus of my work, we, we've done it since 2005, when the Ford Foundation initially launched a National Difficult Dialogues program. Um, and our focus has been on really equipping faculty with the skills and the confidence and the resources that they need to proactively plan on the relevant and appropriate um, difficult dialogues that they should be having in their classes so that they can go well. 
so that the students don't have to handle that. It is the responsibility of the faculty members to both model how we engage in a democracy across differences of all kinds, across identities of all kinds, to make it a safe and brave space for those dialogues. And um, it is uh, wonderful if the students also have been trained to facilitate, but in that context, which is a very different context than when you're out of a classroom, we're hoping to equip the faculty to do that. And most faculty, you know, a lot of faculty haven't even gotten training in how to teach, right? They're specialists in their discipline, let alone how to proactively introduce difficult dialogues and have them go well in the classroom. So that's our primary focus. I also work with faculty, of course, on things like overcoming implicit bias, how to respond to microaggressions, different ways to address difficult dialogues that may surprise you that you weren't planning on, but are your responsibility none, nonetheless. Great, thank you. Sure. What you do? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Roger Fisher. I use he, him, his uh, pronouns, preferably. Um, I'm going to be brief because I, I want to get to the good stuff. Um, so more about my connection to dialogue. Um, so I'm fond of saying that I tolerate my job, which is an administrative role at the University of Michigan, for which they've agreed to pay me. And that allows me to do the work that I love, which is um, training and supporting and co-learning and co-working with largely students who are preparing and then also being um, peer facilitators, near peer facilitators, peer social justice educators. Um, in my role, I'm also able to um, work nationally um, to really try to advance the field of intergroup relations and intergroup dialogue. Um, for us as a program, for us that means social justice education, not as social justice education, educating about social justice. It really is social justice education as education for social justice, um, social justice education as liberatory practice, and for us, I think that means really uh, working with students to motivate, inspire, and equip them to participate in forms of social justice um, that benefits those who have the privilege of that education and also those who do not have the pri privilege of that education. Um, so that's my work. And that's my connection, I guess, to dialogue. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Well, I know we did the formal introductions. I did want everybody to hear your what you do in your own words. Um, and I also think it's important to really frame this out because we're very intentional in thinking about this, this conversation in um, about who, who was gonna be a part of this, right? We wanna be able to speak to multiple audiences. So we wanna be able to speak to um, students who are navigating both co-curricular spaces and classroom spaces. We wanted to be able to speak to faculty who are navigating faculty spaces or advising situations with students. We wanna be able to think about, you know, professionals who are in co-curricular spaces or in community spaces. And so I, again, I'm thrilled to have you all here and have your expertise from these different perspectives to, uh, to, to bring us into this, into this conversation. So as, as Roger said, let's get to the good stuff. Um, so, you know, this webinar is really about planning pre and post election conversations. And so I want to ask you all, you know, what was your experience with the last presidential election? And um, what were you like, where were you? You know, what was that experience like? Were you in school? Where were you? Where were you? Where were you in the world? What kinds of dialogues were you involved in before and after? And, and the lead up to that is, you know, I think it's important for us to reflect on where we were in 2016, because some things might be very similar this time in 2020, and they also might be very different. But let's let's start with the history and move to the present. So, Roger, would you start us off? Sure. Um, I guess a pithy response would be a nightmare, but that, that wouldn't get us very far in the conversation. Um, I can recall that locally here on campus and then in the surrounding metropolitan Detroit area, even in the lead up to the election um, in 2016, I think we were experiencing lots of polarization in lots of communities. Um, I think it, it became more fraught and difficult for people to take the risk associated with becoming vulnerable in dialogic spaces. And it wasn't clear or it wasn't compelling for folks that the benefit would be sufficient to put themselves in that space. So I think as the need or the 
importance of dialogue was growing during that polarization, attracting people to that dialogic space became conversely more difficult or less attractive at least. Um, I think certainly um, following the election, um, that was only exacerbated. So people on campus, off campus, um, institutions of education, nonprofits, community leaders, I think were just kind of driven out of the woodwork, seeking skills, seeking tools, seeking advice about what can we do to start some healing, start some, um, I guess some rudimentary coalition building. What can we do to try to address or to ready ourselves for what we think might be a long four years? And that was prescient because it has been a long four years. Um, I think what we can learn from the last election and apply to our current situation is, this is a real opportunity, I think, to create opportunities for students um, to engage in affirming and possibility rich learning environments and opportunities that again will inspire and, and equip them. Um, and hopefully that this would motivate them to participate individually or within a community or across difference in building more socially just spaces. Um, short of that, I think at a minimum, what we wanna do is be able to reveal and to um, demystify uh, for our students and our participants, the institutions and the environment that they are participating in and to put name and context um, to what it is they experience every day as harm and trauma. Um, yeah, I think that's what, what I am left with thinking about from the 2016 election to present. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So really think about that, the harm and, um, and and think about caring for, for one another. Libby, what about you? Um, well, what I remember is I was doing what I had been doing. So I'd been doing it for about 10 years at that point, working with faculty in workshops from two hours to five days, you know. Um, and as we in, approached the election, I began to put out maybe more and more intense possibilities in terms of when I work with faculty, they go through the dialogue processes and strategies we have themselves so they can learn what it's like to be a student. And then we discuss how to apply it and what that's gonna look like in their context and so forth and so on. And um, I think I mentioned this to you earlier, what I discovered, I'll just say it in a certain sense was a certain naivete. I mean, and let us also recognize that the demographics of the faculty and the demographics of the students uh, have some gaps right between them. And um, so, a lot of the faculty um, really, I think, weren't easily able to come up to speed on what could happen. And, um, and I do think one of the lessons we've talk, talk, taken from the last election is you really do need to be able to imagine possibilities that might not have occurred to you in other times now um, and begin to plan for things that we shouldn't probably have to plan for, but we can't be naive about, because I would find that when working with faculty is. So I would begin to drop in uh, topics that were genuinely alarming uh, to many people present, including people in the room, faculty members themselves, their family members, and so forth, and got some upset from that. But I kept saying, we need to be clear about this. This could become policy. This could become law. We could cert soon be working with our students about things that we really haven't been working with on before. Certain kind of things could start coming into the classroom as they have. Um, certain kind of things could be getting affirmation from the highest levels that we've never seen before. So we need to ramp the game up basically. So that's what I remember as we went into the election. Um, as I, as I, I think I've mentioned to some of you before, uh, the night of the election, I was actually at a national faculty uh, conference of people working with faculty and discovered over the course of the conference that people weren't sure what to do. They, they walked around as if nothing had happened, even though people appeared to be in shock, many of them, not everyone, of course. Um, and so eventually I called, uh, I called out on social media and said, hey, maybe we need to have a dialogue. And so we got together, had an unconference, the whole conference came basically. And we've got, began to really think about what do we need to do in our campuses to prepare people for what's gonna happen as we come home and the unexpected things 
uh, that did happen. And I will say also that there were some faculty there who raised some alarms. They had been raised uh, under dictatorships and they began to speak to these wider groups about the possibilities that they had witnessed in their own countries where folks went after first the press, the free press, second, the judicial system to stack it in a certain way, and third, the academics. And uh, that was enough to cause us to pay attention. Um, so, and then as Roger says, after that, my life has been a, a growth industry of uh, pretty much endless demand ever since for assistance power I can offer. Yeah, so I think that, you know, when we think about these, some of these lessons learned from the, from the last time, it really was a lot about, um, I'm hearing a lot of shifting, right? Like shifting, shifting um, and being flexible and, and really opening our minds up to new possibilities. And some of the ways that we do that is by connecting with people who are outside of our kind of, maybe outside of our regular daily interactions, right? Like we, I don't always think, you know, I have my sort of go-to people for, that I consult. I need to expand that thinking because when we interact with people who are outside of our sphere, we learn and we grow and we think about new possibilities, which is really important. So thanks. Erica, tell us about your experience. Well, um, in 2016, I was 17 years old <laughs> and I was a senior in high school. And it was a very, very different time than it is now. Um, when the last election happened, all of DC public schools, which is where I was going to school at the time, held like a massive walkout um, after Trump was elected. And that was really, really like interesting and new to me. Um, didn't really have any kind of like fully formed political consciousness at the time, no very, like nuanced thoughts about what was happening in the world. I just knew like this was bad um, and this is scary and this is like a bad person to be in charge of our country. And I think participating in the walkouts, I felt this like immense sense of hope, like, oh, this is what political engagement looks like. This is what participatory politics look like. And this is like what my generation does when we're confronted by something that's very like imminent and scary to us. And I was really excited at that time. And I think there was a significant amount of like ignorant bliss around what was happening. And I was just like imagining a future where we continue to organize in response to what was happening in the world. And I mentioned this when we talked before, but I think like, had I been a lot more sentient about what it means to have someone like Donald Trump um, elected to that office, I think it would have been a lot harder for me to like be engulfed in that feeling of like excitement and hope um, and a lot more scared and like consumed with panic um, for what those next four years would look like. And I think there was just like a lot of conversation back and forth between myself and my peers about like, the idea that the next few years could or would be filled with a lot of different decisions that further enacted violence upon already very like vulnerable populations of people, but not really having any idea like what that might look like or what it even means to like carry out a policy as a president or like how much leverage or power that a president even holds. Um, and so I think going to this next election, it's a very different sense of cynicism and like <laughs> very just jaded. Um, and I think much more focused on like care for myself and care for individuals and finding it a lot harder to see the other side of like constant protest and like that kind of like shiny thing that I was looking at when I was 17 is a lot harder to grasp at now. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think you you sit in this really challenging and and in place, right? And and thinking about you know what what the experience was like as a as a 17 year old kind of on the on the precipice of being able to vote and um, thinking, you know, four years later. So this will be, this will be, or is your first election, presidential election that you're voting in. Um, and, um, and also thinking about, you know, we're in a place where the economy is, is not well and looking for a job or, you know, next experiences is really tough during this time. So uh, I hear, I hear, I hear you in terms of, you know, a lot of the pain, the challenges that you've been um, 
you and your generation are dealing with. So, yeah, so thanks for sharing that. Roger, can you talk a little bit more about what happened for you after the election and how you responded? Sure. Um, I think that's really multi-layered. Um, so directly following the election, um, the election was on Tuesday. Our course, Intergroup Dialogues, occurred on Wednesday. Uh, so immediately following the election, um, we had class. And so a decision was made overnight in our program that we would suspend the usual curriculum and then we would create and hold space for students to talk about their location. Um, not in a partisan sort of way. Uh, I think we, we somewhat avoided that, but really to talk about how would things change for them vis-a-vis -vis their access to the resources, the material goods they need, um, their feeling of safety and security, their relationship to what they expected um, out of government, um, their social positionality and threat and risk and harm. So I think um, for us, it became important to help students to either one voice anxiety that had been created as a result of the election, two, to begin a journey of resolve and resilience um, about what needs to be their role in trying to protect themselves and the people that and communities that they care most about. Um, and then to present the possibility for people to think about working in communities larger than their own um, to resist and to become active um, in light of the new administration. I think um, individually more as a personal um, piece I really recognized that the game was going to change at least for the next four years, um, that there was going to be a shrinking of goodwill, a shrinking of the assumption of what I like to think of as human dignity and the um, suspension of skepticism so there was, there was just a more caustic environment in which to try to do our work. Um, I felt that a lot in our work in the K-12 area. Um, school boards changed, uh, principals uh, changed in, in high schools that we worked with. Um, the, the challenges became more frequent, overt, and nasty wow. than they had been previously. Folks who kind of just rolled their eyes in meetings uh, now felt the uh, freedom to speak up and speak up wrong and loud. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think for us, it became clear that strategies had to be modified. Um, we needed to have a tougher skin going forward um, and, and that it was more important. The stakes had just been raised in an unpredictable way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that sharing. And, you know, and yeah, I relate to, to what, what all of you are saying and, you know, and, and thinking about, you know, the ways that you're, you have to care for yourself, right, Erica, the way you have to pivot, you know, as, as Libby and, and Roger uh, mentioned, you know, when I was uh, in 2016, um, I was not at Princeton. Uh, I was at another institution. And um, we also happened to have a, a, a space set up the following day to have um, a conversation, sort of like a, you know, a lunch conversation. And I think many people thought the outcome of the election was going to be different than it was. And so, um, but it was a place to talk about, you know, about, I think even how the vote uh, went for Donald Trump, because many people thought it was going to be Hillary Clinton. And, you know, big shout out to Camille, Dr. Camille Burge. I'm not sure if she's on the webinar, but she was a presenter at that, at that time. Um, and, you know, I, I think and I reflect on that time about what it took for her as a, as a Black woman to be able to facilitate a conversation. Um, it took a lot. I mean, she was presenting. I was sort of like facilitating it, but she was presenting data. And, you know, the ways in which we have to care for ourselves in our moment, in that moment, um, as we move forward through work, right? And thinking, um, you know, I reflect and I think about my experience on that day and thinking about, you know, I got up and I went to work and I was facilitating a lunchtime conversation for folks. And then I had a class from 6 to 9 p.m. that night. Um, and I remember engaging in that class. And I remember talking to students. And uh, I made the decision to just kind of throw out the curriculum. 
for the day and just, you know, talk. And I remember students saying, some students saying, you are the, most of them saying, actually, um, you are the first person all day who has acknowledged what has happened. And students broke down. They broke down in tears. And I had students talking about, you know, they've been on edge all, all day, they, wondering, um, you know, they just imagining and seeing, you know, people being deported from their, um, from their neighborhood. And so there was tremendous fear, right? I, I say, I share this um, because I think that there is so much that we're, we were holding four years ago, there's even more that we're holding now. And so to think about having a plan and really the preparation for that plan is so important. It's so important. Um, and we have to think about what tool we use, what dialogic tool we use in what situation, right? And so, you know, getting to that question um, about the tools, right? This, this, this webinar is also about the tools. Um, you know, talk to me about some of the tools that you all use. And, and I think from, from, from the outset, right? Thinking about how do we set, how do we prepare? How do we set up um, conversations? Um, and and, and what, are, what, are, what do we need to do ahead of time? So um, Erica, let me, let me throw it back to you again. And, and can you tell us a little bit about the preparation that you're, you're having or you're talking about with students right now? So I think that going into this next election, it's very different, obviously. We're all quarantined and like in our own spaces. I'm not on campus, so I'm not doing the same kind of facilitation work that I would usually be doing. Um, despite the virtual programming that we have going on. But I think we're at a time in this year where I really have to spend a lot of time taking care of myself. <laughs> um, 2020 has been immense and very long. And part of being able to hold space for others is taking the time to hold space for yourself. Um, I'm not very useful or impactful to anybody else if I haven't had like a moment to breathe um, and to grieve a lot of what's happening around me. And so I think one of those skills is just like radical self-care as we've talked about a couple of different times amongst ourselves. Um, and knowing when I've had too much of like social media or the news or crying, like <laughs> just taking time and doing something that is fun to me and revitalizing to me um, is a first step. I think being very intentional about the people I care for and making it very clear that I'm there and ready and available for those conversations, particularly people who I hold similar identities with and who we can like create that safe space for one another. Um, something that Roger has mentioned a few times in some of our conversations and I've been thinking about a lot is how there's a time, there was a time when we would enter dialogue spaces and the assumption or one of the community agreements was always assume best intentions. And the assumption there was that everybody was entering this space willingly because they wanted to come to a shared knowledge and like a shared space of understanding with one another. And that meant that we all had a shared understanding of each other's humanity and like putting each other's humanity at the forefront. and that's something that we really took for granted because I don't think that's as much the case anymore. I mean, there were co conversations I was facilitating this past summer in which students from campus would purposely come and join under the guise of wanting to participate and antagonize students who were in there who were incredibly vulnerable and who were like sharing raw moments. And they would show up for the explicit purpose of saying nasty things in the chat and like recording what had happened there and taking it back to their groups. Um, various different like conservative groups on campus. We're doing a lot of this over the summer. And so it's a lot harder to step into a space and trust that everybody is there to hold your best interest at heart. And so the simple step of like making it clear to the people around me that I am here for you and I intend to continue to be here for you is really important. I think like really regardless of which way this election goes, it's gonna be very heavy for a lot of people. Um, and very scary in a lot of different ways in like a physical embodied kind of way in a just like sense of doom of like what happens next and knowing where you can turn at any moment in time is really, really, really important. Um, I think also thinking back to when the last election happened, I was in a space of really wanting to like bridge different experiences. And I was very much like a 
middle of the road minded person that like if we all just listened to each other and were patient and like spoke to each other kindly that we could come to a sense of understanding and I'm not in that place anymore <laughs> and I'm not exerting my energy and trying to like bring people from vastly different experiences together when I know that some of those experiences will create violence for others who are already experiencing violence from the world around them and so that means like if that means that I'm creating intentional spaces where I'm like, this is just a space for queer students, for black students, for femme identified people, for disabled students, for people who are facing the immediate fear of deportation or ICE, et cetera. And this conversation is just for us. This isn't about intergroup dialogue. This is about creating intentional safe spaces for you. That's what's most important to me right now. That's where my energy is being exerted. And I think that's sometimes a lot harder to do under the guise of equity, diversity, and inclusion this like catch all phrase that's often thrown around in institutions and in the university specifically, it's a lot harder to work around that space. Um, and I'm very, very fortunate that the people who, who supervise me in those spaces are of a similar mindset and are, are being very intentional about creating spaces for people who just like, the world is not, has not been loving them. Um, I think that is a large part of how I'm like looking forward to what happens next week, <laughs> a week from today, and um, what comes next after that, because it's just so utterly unpredictable. Thank you for that. So, you know, I, I, I want to acknowledge, Livy, I haven't gotten you in the conversation for a moment. I, I do want to pivot to, to Roger just for a second, because I think that there are some pieces what, that we've had previous conversations about that really connect to what, to what Erica just spoke to. Um, and then, and then Livy, I want to pull you in for some more skill building. Yeah, I definitely want to pick up on what Erica was saying. And, and uh, once again, she's blown my mind. Um, and I'm I supposed to be prepared to address this question, but then you made me think hard. Uh, so... Let me, let me try to uh, improvise a little bit. Um, so this idea of self-care, right? Um, and, and radical self-care, absolutely we need to be as a discipline, more so than an optional tool. We need to be, all of us involved in this really should step up our game to practice that radical self-care as a discipline necessary to being a good social justice educator. I couldn't underscore that enough. Um, I've been in conversations with folks who even take into saying self-love because I think we're at a stage in the national discourse that makes the idea of loving oneself itself a radical and resistant notion. Um, you, you might hear the passion in my voice because I think there's a way in which um, those of us who are involved in this in whatever ways and levels that we've been involved in this can oftentimes discount or set aside or make tertiary what it means to be engaged in this for any length or duration of time. I am consistent now in talking to the people that I get an opportunity to coach and work with that understand that this work is hard, it is counterintuitive, it is beautiful and challenging that the sand underneath your feet are always shifting. You're doing this in a context now where people are kind of going crazy with cancel culture and one, one misspoken word might get you erased or canceled. Um, the, the environment in which we're doing this is, has never been easy and it's only getting harder. Superimpose on that, that the environments in which we're doing this work is almost always toxic. Emotionally, psychologically, mentally toxic. And so if we were doing environmental cleanup, we'd be in hazmat suits and we'd have to do all kinds of safety precautions. And I think that's what we need to do now um, in the ways that are important for us as individuals, recognize that you're working in a toxic environment. What are the sort of mental and psychological hazmat suits that you can employ 
what is the protocols and procedures that are necessary and essential for your safety and your well-being. Um, for me, I've taken to talking to my family and my friends about, hey, I'm practicing mental and psychological uh, and emotional hygiene today. That is disconnecting from the news. I'm a news junkie. My friends know that. I'm, it's nothing for me to do six hours of news in a day. But some days I'm, I'm just practicing hygiene. I need to disconnect. I need to spend time with squirrels and birds and, and flowing rivers. Um, but I think, again, to underscore this, um, all that Erica brought to the table, um, we can't be in service to our cause and the people that we care most about and do it as martyrs. This isn't an age for martyrs. This is an age for champions. And that means we all get to uh, whatever version of success that or overcoming that we realize, I think um, the goal should be we all get there. Yes, thank you for that, Roger. Yes, we have to. So a major part of our preparation is caring for ourselves. We cannot show up for a dialogue, it, a hot mess, not gotten sleep, you know, you know, tears in our eyes falling apart, you know, that's not going to work right? That's not going to work for us. And so that is a part of the preparation is how do we care for ourselves? So, so Libby, thank you for your patience. Uh, bring us into to the way that you do prep preparation. And that's, that's the foundation of your work, right? It is indeed. Um, but before I was just quickly looking up if a guy could find caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation. And that is an act of political warfare coming from Audre Lorde, one of the great heroes of Black folks, Black queer folks, Black women, everybody. Um, so, um, with that said, I will shift a bit here. Um, so safety has been mentioned by everyone. Um, and I am hearing from many, many folks all around the nation and my state about how do we potentially employ dialogue to prevent violence? Is there a place for dialogue when violence comes? How do we prepare and so on? So I just want to say that today I was involved in initiating with the chancellor of my university and I'm working with them as we speak for messaging that needs to go out. And I also am working with the state legislature as we speak because I'm not sure the governor will do it um, to begin blanketing messages out to our communities on our campuses and on our town and in our state and saying that many, many things about how difficult times are and how divided we are and how COVID is stressing us all out and how it goes on up here, climate change is threatening many people's lives um, and how one of the shared commitments we have is to not engage in violence. We may disagree on many things. Um, uh, we may have difficulty treating one another with great respect and dignity, even though we call for them to do that, of course, in this message. Um, we were encouraging people not to um, gloat, not to name call, not to do all kinds of things after the election, regardless what happens. We're encouraging people to prepare for the long time of uncertainty in the middle of all this other stress. But the piece we're really speaking to is that commitment that we will not engage in violence. Um, and that's a starting point so that people can calm down a bit on every front, um, because a lot of that has been spurred by disinformation um, through social media and it's hard to tell anymore what's going on. So I'll just put that out there and also that we're in, uh, inviting students to drop in structured conversations to share, faculty the same, staff the same. And what I'm encouraging people to do is to come and share, how are you feeling? What are you afraid of? Uh, what is it that you need? What is it that you want in these drop-in groups right after the election? Um, rather than positions, we will not be having positions taken. We will not be arguing with people. We will not even be cross-talking with other people. They are spaces for people to come being together and to process how they are. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, but so in that regard, we're preparing for the immediate aftermath and trying, of course, to calm the waters so that we uh, can help people feel safer. There's a bunch of other things as well, but I did wanna say that because maybe those of us listening can do the same uh, from whatever role you play in your university or your community to activate people. We do have a week. They could do that messaging now. 
So, but in terms of my own work, right? So, which is all about preparation, as you say, you know, um, and helping in mostly faculty um, move in that direction. Um, one of the things that we talk about is, is what you did at the beginning, Bridget, right? Acknowledging in the context of a classroom or whatever dialogue, wow, right? Wow, things are unspeakably hard for most people um, in these names and, and naming all the sources of those stresses before we go into any kind of a dialogue um, so that people feel heard, they feel seen, we invite some of the you know, mindfulness practices that are sweeping around the world these days, whether that is to sit still for a moment and breathe as you did, slow down, reflect in writing often beforehand. You know, If you're gonna share about what your feelings and fears and needs and things are, maybe we take three minutes beforehand, invite people to write things down together. It's trickier because we're online. Usually we would put them into listening partners to do something like that, but it's trickier. So, but just anything we can do before we go into dialogue that slows people down um, is useful. Um, any, kind, any kind of exercise that builds common ground, um, simple icebreakers that faculty and other people use all the time that, you know, find favorite foods and find people sharing, you know, finding out with each other what they most appreciate about winter. Just silly, seemingly silly, superficial things that begin to remind each other that across our differences, uh, we have similarities and can find each other. I'm, I'm, and I wanna say to Erica's point, I agree with right now, caucusing is what I call it. I agree that people within their own identity groups, particularly the more vulnerable and, and margin minoritized groups need and deserve and we should protect and create spaces where it's just folks talking with one another. That's a form of critical dialogue right now. And if people don't wanna to have to go across lines right now, I don't think that they should. But in a class, that's going to happen, right? And so um, these kinds of things that start to build some trust, some community sense of reminder of shared humanity, recognizing also that we've been forced into these bubbles. If you've seen the movie, The Social Dilemma, <laughs> you'll realize that there is a commercialized mechanism behind a lot of the separation that we're feeling, a lot of the disinformation that we're getting, a lot of the alarmism where people think other people are about to rush over and eat other people's babies, which they would never do in a million years, but nobody knows anymore, um, that kind of thing. So, so contextualizing things is super important. Um, We'll put in the chat line a book, the free book that I mentioned before. It's called Start Talking, a Handbook for Engaging Difficult Dialogues in Higher Education. It's primarily aimed at the classroom. The strategies are transferable. Um, and so I encourage people to look into applying some of those. For example, um, there are, well, they range all over the board, but we haven't spoken enough about simply creating guidelines for how we're going to talk with one another about a topic if there was only one thing that we all did before we engaged in dialogue in this next period of time. It, in my mind, would be that. Whether that comes from the facilitator bringing those in, um, if you don't have a lot of time, or facilitator bringing them in and having students or other people add to them, or co-creating with students, which we talk about in the book, right? Or wh whatever we need to do. And then in these days, I include, we do not, tolerate emotional or physical violence, period, in this classroom. So we have agreements about what happens if people start to violate those, so forth and so on. Anyways, I can go on and on, but there, there, there are obviously, um, but in, in the book, there are a lot of strategies if you're interested and we, you know, we can talk more about that. Yeah, thank you, Libby, thank you. Libby is a, a treasure trove of, of, of tools um, for engaging. Um, I, you know, I want to continue on with uh, this, this theme about preparation, right? Um, and we've gotten a few questions, uh, we've gotten a lot of questions uh, from the audience, but particularly um, some questions about the current context, right? And so I think that we've, we've also had a lot of conversation, even in preparing for this, for our webinar today, in terms of thinking about, like, what do, what do we do when people aren't playing by the rules, right? What do we do when people aren't willing to abide by the guidelines? How do we prepare in light of an executive order, right? How do we how do we prepare 
you know, higher education has been notoriously behind in preparing. How do we change that narrative and, and, and flip and try to prepare a little bit more? So I know I've sprung this question on you all. Is anybody feeling super compelled to jump in? I can also give an example to give you all a moment to think a little bit more. So for me, I think one of the things that is really helpful in, in terms of preparing is, um, is also thinking about the outcomes, right? The possible outcomes. Uh, we have to name those possibilities. And, and Libby, I think you talked about this a bit at the beginning, right? Is, is we have to engage with one another. We have to imagine possibilities that we wouldn't have ordinarily thought of before. So, you know, what happens if there is, uh, again, using, using our presidential election that is, that is sort of in process right now? What happens if there's an overwhelming Biden win? What happens if there's an overwhelming Trump win? What happens if there is a contested Biden win? What happens if there's a contested Trump win? What happens if there's violence from the right? What happens if there's violence from the left? What happens if there's violence all across the board, right? These are some of the possibilities. And these are scary to acknowledge because in a year like 2020, when so much has already been challenging and difficult, for me, I'll say, it's challenging to even invoke some more negativity coming into this world, right? Like, I don't know if I'm ready to handle what it literally looks like in my suburban neighborhood to have violence happening on my street. But that is a real possibility, right? These are the conversations that I'm engaging in in my home. Do we need to have a plan if there's violence, you know, in a week? What are, what are we going to do? What is our plan, right? And these are not conversations I thought I would be having. Having These were not conversations that I was having four years ago. So others, what, what what's changed? Erica, I see you've been muted. I have. Go for um, it. Yes, I'm thinking about this piece that's been shared. Um, and I will say, speaking for myself, I don't, I don't adopt a non-violence rhetoric or politic. Um, I think that when we talk about the idea of non-violence or we talk about like going into a conversation and saying that we don't tolerate violence in this space, doesn't speak to the like inherent power imbalance and in that violence already exists in the space. It is there inherently. Um, and it is unilaterally enacted upon marginalized and minoritized people. Um, and so it's kind of impossible for me to look at this election and the fact that the conversations that I'm already having are like my friends going home for the weekend because their parents are terrified of them being in their college towns. Or last week, I'm at dinner with my friends and a massive truck with very large Trump flags comes roaring down the street yelling at us and that I can't leave my house without experiencing violence. It is a part of my experience. And so what does that mean to try to espouse some kind of rhetoric around nonviolence? I don't think that exists. And so I, I cannot find the place or the platform to advocate for nonviolence in response to whatever happens next week, whether Biden wins, there's a response from those who didn't want him and who feel emboldened by his winning to terrorize people. Whether Trump wins, there are people who are emboldened by him taking another four years that they enact violence upon people. Like that power dynamic is there regardless. And to me, we're at the stage of like, what does it mean to defend myself? And what does it look like to defend myself um, when I'm not allowed to ever consider what it means to disassociate from violence? And so I'm thinking about that a lot. And that kind of goes to your question, Bridget, about like when people stop playing by the rules, because it's also like whose rules, <laughs> like who constructs them and like what rule guide were we playing by in the first place? Um, it looked like me just continuing to internalize a rhetoric that I have to like neutralize the situation so that I can protect myself and also like create the leeway for other people to keep enacting violence upon me. And I don't, that doesn't sit right with me anymore. Um, I think 2020 more than any other time in my lifetime has laid very bare the like complete imbalance of this conversation around nonviolence and it's like a similar kind of conversation we have around free speech. And um, I think that the rules have been thrown out. <laughs> Any kind of societal norm that we were 
previously conforming to and like following is gone. And I think that's really scary for a lot of people, but I think that is because their sense of security and safety has been completely unseated. And for a lot of people who never had that sense of security to begin with, this just looks to them like next steps in an inevitable process that was already coming. And um, I think for myself, who's had a very like privileged, sheltered life in a lot of ways, um, in a lot of ways, and who never had to think about this as a reality until I forced myself into that space and until like the people whose daily experiences I'm, I really like try to like keep up with and support them on a regular kind of basis, like has laid bare to me what violence in a continuous way looks like, like systemic, institutional, et cetera. Um, I'm moving myself out of the place of discomfort about what it means to accept that violence is already the norm and that it has to be engaged with to a degree to move from this, this thinking place to the action place. And that's something I recognize about myself is like a place that I don't want to be in. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. Thank you, Erica. Yeah, that's, you know, that's a really poignant um, way of, of, of putting this. And I, I don't, I don't, I can't say it any better. You know, I think you said it very, very, very well. Um, and I appreciate that. Um, there's a lot of violence in the world and, you know, some people have um, abilities to engage in it and some people don't. Um, so it's how, how do we engage with it? Yeah. Roger, do you want to jump in? Yeah, um, again, I just, where do we go, right? And so some of this conversation, I think we touched upon even in our uh, prep for uh, this session and whether it's, you um, Afro-pessimism or whatever the framing um, is, anti-Blackness, um, we're challenged in this moment. We're challenged in this moment. Um, and I, th I think I shared with this group, maybe not my uh, colleagues back at Michigan, but I've even been thinking about, do we need to overtly reframe intergroup dialogue as dignity-based dialogic work. So spaces in which everyone comes to the table affirming and expecting to be affirmed for their human dignity or reclaiming or um, having reclaimed their dignity um, if they're in a role where they've been per perpetrating um, violence on others. I think there's ways in which we just have to explicitly and overtly challenge our participants that they are coming to the table with the idea of shared dignity. I don't know where we would take that. I'm not, it's, it's just a notion, but I do agree with Erica that um, the idea that uh, violence and harm and trauma is sort of left at the door is, is a mythology that we can no longer afford to play with. Um, I don't think there's any way that uh, we can invite students into a space where we don't address the fact that trauma and harm and um, violence and risk are a part of their everyday experience. Yeah. Um, I think another thing that we need to do is really be thoughtful in ways in which both in our pedagogy, but also in our curriculums, in our readings, that people are challenged to interrupt that. And not in a, a one-sided way, but everyone who's a participant, what are the ways in which you are in your participation in this dialogue, interrupting that cycle? And are you prepared to be challenged by the other participants in how much you're contributing to the interruption of that pattern? Mm -hmm. Um, and lastly, I guess what, what I would say is, I just saw this video, um, Angela Davis, I, I can watch Angela Davis talk about making cookies, but she said, you know, what's going to be required of everyone is a notion of hyper empathy. 
And she went on to describe what she meant by hyper empathy and the courage associated with this notion of being hyper empathetic. And I thought, oh my God, you know, <laughs> um, talk about the elevator going to the, to the top floor. Um, I think it is gonna be um, necessary for us to think about what does being hyper empathetic when I'm being empathetic for my own intrinsic goals, not just as a courtesy or a gift to you as another participant, but I'm being empathetic because it allows me to participate in this thing that we're doing together. So I'm going to be hyper empathetic. Um, check it out. Uh, you can uh, Google it, it's on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I, I think there is no way in which our practice and our pedagogy are not gonna to have to change to reflect um, our present and what is our likely future. Thank you. You know, there's, uh, I wanna grab in a couple of uh, more comments from, from the audience, um, or questions from the audience, but there is one comment where someone says, um, listening to you today is part of my self care. So um, much appreciation, much love, much thanks for that. Um, I do want to continue to dig into what, you know, we were just been talking about here is, um, you know, this idea about, you know, acknowledging the violence, acknowledging the harms that have been done, but also when you're in a situation where that's, where uh, somebody is not acknowledging, what strategies can you use to create a different space that feels more inclusive? And how do you, how do you engage in a conversation with somebody who's not willing to acknowledge the harms that have been done by this administration? This is a summary of a question from Tiffany Colvin. Thank you. So anybody have thoughts about that? How do you engage in strategies with folks who aren't acknowledging uh, the harm that's been, been done? Yeah. I'm gonna leap in and wander around here for just a second. I'm wanting, going back to what was said earlier. I mean, I've been, we have had dialogues on the campus about is the use of violence ever justified, for example. When is the use of violence ever justified? These are humbling and powerful um, dialogues that have gone on for a very long time. We had Martin Luther King coming from one place and leading people in these extraordinary ways, knowing they were heading into the constant violence that black folks faced every moment of their lives, knowing it was coming their way. We had uh, Malcolm X who took a different tactic uh, to the same situation. Uh, from a self-defense standpoint, right? Understandably. We have work that's happened, I mentioned in an earlier conversation, Central America, where some people in the, in the Catholic Church, given the violence that was happening in Central America, took the viewpoint that, you know, Jesus says, never ever use violence and inflict it on another person, no matter what they're doing to you. And other people who said, nope, um, liberation theology says you defend people who are being attacked using violence if you must, right? So this is one of the big difficult dialogues of, of humanity, I think, and it's it's coming around again. And I think we need to draw on all the wisdom of our elders and, and the history that we can. And I don't know the answer any better than anybody else does. I think we make our choices as best we can. I do know that I have been in contact with national organizations that are prepping for this. There's one called Choosing Democracy that has been preparing people or what do we do? And they are drawing from the civil rights um, movement uh, history and lessons about how to meet violence with um, nonviolence. Um, uh, from the standpoint, not that it's not uh, deserved, like has been mentioned before, people people have a right to self-defense, uh, in my opinion. Um, but in I think on the premise of escalation leads to to where where will that go, and will the most vulnerable people pay? Um, Anyway, so that's this very large conversation. I can barely remember what else you were asking me, but um, <laughs> um, how do you engage with the, with people who aren't willing to acknowledge the uh, the harm that is? Well, the first thought I had. This is hard. Let's just all say it, right? This is hard. We're we're super um, in, uh, involved people here, and it's still super hard. My first thought has to do with stories. That um, one of the things that we've discovered that actually helps people change their mind. One of the few things we've discovered that actually helps people change their mind is when they hear people's stories. And you know, I'm aware of the fact that people who've been traumatized are often stuck up there to tell their stories, right? And that they say, I'm sick of being the poster child for telling my story uh, with uh, other people who may or may not have empathy. And that makes perfect sense to me. If people are willing, um, starting with stories about the harm, about the trauma, 
about what it's like when your parent is terrified in their home because they might be deported, about what it's like to be a trans black person, you know, with the, the kinds of hostilities that you meet every breath of your life, you know, about what it's like to go to your campus and feel people say, you know, have them say these things to you all day long, about what it's like to have your own president uh, do and say things that terrorize you, right? The, that's the way I've seen, the, the, the fastest way I've seen to building empathy. It's certainly not data. It's certainly not taking a position. It's certainly not arguing. It's none of those things work, right? Um, that's one thing. So anyway, I'll throw that out there. And I, I also did want to um, notch that you said somebody asked about the executive order. Yes, yes. Um, and so just super quickly, for those of you who don't know, President Trump uh, exercised his capacity to do an executive order. It's called something like an executive order combating sexism and racism in you know, the federal government or something. And it allows the feds to uh, withdraw funds, uh, federal funding, including from universities, including from research, including from contracts anywhere in their agencies that do certain things that they think are offensive. And the, the preamble to the order is a spectacular piece of rhetoric. I commend it unto you as uh, a, a piece of, honestly, wow, um, genius rhetoric that is, I barely know what to say. Um, and then they outline eight things that we are not allowed to do, people who are involved in equity work and trainings and so forth and so on. Um, and what I will say is that you can actually do this work without stepping over those borders because of the way they've been phrased. Most of us are not in fact doing the things that we are accused of doing in those eight things. I will also say, I don't think that's the point. I think the point of this is to begin to allow people to report universities for doing this kind of work and drain them of critical resources at a critical point by lawsuits. And I say that uh, going back to one of my first comments, which is when people warned us that they could go for first the press, which they have, second, the judiciary, which they have, and third, the academics. And so uh, I think you need to, those of you who are interested in, in, in this impacts, consult with your general counsel. There are higher ed general counsels meeting about this as we speak. And if, if the administration shifts, we'll be in one context and not have to worry about this in the same way. But if it does not, I, I encourage you to mm -hmm. get resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. You know, I, going back to a point you made uh, just, a, just a moment ago, Libby, about um, about uh, about narratives and stories, right? I, um, shout out, shouts out to my colleagues at Villanova in the communication department. Um, and one of the things that we would constantly talk about is that you know data informs, but stories convince, right? And so, how can we set ourselves up to um, to 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 get into that um, you know emotional connection with people? Um, just really quickly, somebody asked if some if. Um, uh, social distancing is getting away, in, getting in the way of, of empathy building, and and it's quite possible. It's quite it's quite possible. It's a different way of connecting. Um, you know, oftentimes virtually. Um, I, I do find that if if the conditions are right, if you define your situation, if you really think about what kind of conversation you're going to have, um, you can set up conditions where people can be um, quite vulnerable. Actually, um, in 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 Zoom settings, right. Um, so it is important to think about that context and really setting up is, is really important. I, I wanna ask a, another question um, and uh, panelists, you can feel free to answer this question and, uh, and or answer or, or add on to a previous question that has already been asked. Um, so someone asks, uh, what role, if any, does a DEI office have to support conservative students, staff or faculty so they don't feel alienated or targeted? So let me just, I guess, um, frame or reframe that as a question, right? Because it, it makes an assumption, I think, that DEI offices don't do that. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's true. I think all DEI offices have in its mission the education of all students. And usually in a way that has um, absorbed um, efforts around liberatory education and social justice education in, in um, ways that are very helpful in ways that can be counterproductive if not thoughtfully considered, right? Um, 
And this may connect to some of the earlier comments around what happens in the dialogue space. Because I think one thing is people have a notion sometimes of dialogue as sort of um, voyeuristic politeness or cultural consumerism. Um, and if that is what we're doing, then there's no place for that kind of education in a liberatory space. If what we're doing in intergroup or intragroup dialogue is really saying that dialogue is a place for dissent, dissent from every angle, from every facet, from every space, um, and that we are going to utilize the tools that we have around communication, both inquiry and counter narrative, um, experiential activities that don't exploit people for their lived experiences. We can use all those tools, but that the goal is not to be polite and nice or to get to learn something about someone that I'm unfamiliar with or I find exotic, but it's really to, to speak truth to power is for dissent. And I think all of us who've been in this work for any length of time have elicited tears through dissonance, cognitive dissonance that I couldn't get by slapping someone. So I'm really cool with the violence of dissonance. I'll get all in your psyche. And I will ask you with your permission, I will ask you, well, what would cause you to think that way? What is it that you're trying to protect by not considering the lives of other people? What motivates you to be that way, right? So I think there's ways in which um, with permission of our participants that there's um, quote unquote violence that is done in the service of learning and growth and unlearning and transformation that we do all the time if we're being successful as liberatory educators. Well, and to just put one quick piece in and, and back to something Erica said earlier around free speech, because I've lost more night's sleep than I could tell you trying to wrestle that one down. Um, because it is unequal and it is unfair and we have these historical pieces that are not taken into account with our current free speech laws and, and so forth and so on. Um, is people are protected in their right to speech. They are not protected against the consequences of their speech. And, and, and they are not protected from hearing about the impacts of their views or their actions, which is what you're speaking to, I think, Roger. And I think we get to ramp that up enormously in these kinds of dialogues where people um, do get to say what they believe and then they get to be pressed into exploring the impact and the consequences and are they good with what that policy or that position implies to other people's, perhaps other people in that very room. Thank you. If, if I can just tag on for a sec. Mm -hmm. Please. I think in our training, it's really important for um, new educators, new facilitators, always to be reminded that your participants, no matter where they are coming from, the social positionality, the social identities that they hold, for the purposes of the educational experience, if you're going to be the educator, you cannot see them as your enemy. Your enemy is the hegemony that came in the room with them, yeah. that dominant narrative, that master narrative, that grand narrative that is poisoning us all. That's your, if you have to, if it's helpful for you to identify your enemy, that's, if, that's your enemy. Yeah. All of your participants have the potential to be co-resistors and solutionaries in helping to form a better, society, a more just society. And, and it's important that you see them as holding the potential to one day participate in interrupting these cycles of oppression. Otherwise, it's a pointless endeavor. Yes, thank you, Roger. Thank you, Roger. Absolutely. Helps us to see the humanity in one another. Absolutely. Erica, we have just a few minutes left. I want to pull you into the conversation for any additional thoughts you have. You can answer a specific question or just say what you want to say. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> um, well, I don't, 
no, for this question, this conversation that's being had right now, I don't know if I have the answer people want to hear. Um, my mother texted me and told me to fix my face. So <laughs> I apologize, but that is my immediate reaction. Um, I, I think there are a lot of different pieces. It's the fact that EDI, DEI work is in its essence trying to get at this like equal playing field concept that I don't think exists. And so maybe it's just the fact that EDI is doing the thing that I do not want to and cannot. Um, I think I'm also not interested in opening tiny spaces for people to enter that have been already like disenfranchised to enter and have like these conversations inside of this larger inherently violent space and expect people to understand each other at the end of the day. I think I'm interested in deconstructing and dismantling the inherently violent space. So to me, to go to a place like Princeton and like invest a lot of time in the EDI office when I know at the end of the day, they're not trying to do radical work in a sense, because that's not feasible or sustainable in the institution that it exists in. To me, I just am kind of like running in circles, like what am I doing here? <laughs> um, and so I think there's that part in that the question is how do we hold space for, for conservative students to not feel quote unquote alienated. And to me, that's a really hard question to be hit with because it's, I don't, the, the idea of alienation or targeting, again, to me is a very, it's seated on a massive power dynamic. And how do you target or alienate people who are already sitting at the top? Like, and that is not to make a, a blanket statement of conservative people in any way, shape or form, but people who are holding the kind of opinions that were like attempting to, to dismantle or to like, work through together because we collectively recognize that there is an inherent violence to the opinion. It's like, why am I spending time doing that? Why, why am I spending time convincing people that my life matters? I can't enter that conversation and like have to do that work in the first place. And then once I finally get you to believe to some degree that my life matters, then I'm like, okay, let me also put my trauma on display for you to understand why my life matters and what it looks like on a daily basis. Like that is, a line of work and I don't think it's the one that I am can be in um and so I think there's that piece that the question is just I don't think that you can <laughs> center certain opinions and and not make people feel quote unquote alienated or targeted so I think there's that um there's there's a there's a question about Yes, sorry, there are many comments about shades of conservatism and I'm making a lot of blanket statements. I realize that I'm also very like, have a lot of different thoughts going through my we, head. We can have this conversation <laughs> another two hours, right? I mean, this is, there's uh, a lot of deep things to talk about here. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I had a lot of different things I was thinking about around pieces that Libby and Roger both shared mm -hmm. and a lot of questions in the, sec in the comment section, but, um, I am working in the process of a very radical politic. I'm trying day by day to adopt it more because that to me feels like how we get free and the we being those who are not currently free. And I am thinking about like Audre Lorde has already been invoked here. Like you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. So like, what does it mean to keep spending time on this same conversation that is still causing violence to people, is still oppressing people. Um, I, so I think I'm just very like, I'm really glad I'm a senior because I'm about to graduate <laughs> and like leave Princeton, which obviously I have to grapple with all the very wonderful things that Princeton has provided me in terms of access and whatnot. And I take those things into role, whatever whatever conversation about divesting and redistributing, et cetera. Um, but I'm just, I'm ready to like leave Princeton and stop having to think about what it means to meet people in the middle and stop having to expend energy because the only way that I feel like I can make a difference on campus right now is by participating in those spaces. Like 
the ODI office and like DDA even, which as much as I loved as a first year, is such a flawed system. Like again, this conversation of making already traumatized students put their trauma on display to make other people learn is a very constant conversation we have year in and year out and is not productive. Mm -hmm. And I've had this conversation with um, someone whose opinion I really value a lot and like sharing with him the structure of DDA, he's like, it sounds like you're just training a lot of people to, to like pacify people just to like get these spaces like Princeton. And I think it does a lot of that and I'm not understanding the end goal if it continues to sustain a place like Princeton. So I'm just like thinking about that. And we have to think creatively, right? We have to think, I mean, it's this, it's interesting how our conversations, you know, take these arcs and it brings us back to, um, you know, variations of where, of where we begin, right? And, and, and in terms of imagining, we have to have a radical imagination to, to think of something new, to think of something different. And, and we cannot act differently if we cannot imagine a different kind of, a different possibility, a different future. And so this, those pieces are, are critical. Um, I do, I do want to acknowledge our, our, our time and, um, and value the time of our colleagues and our, our audience members and our participants. And so um, in, in closing, I do want to say, you know, I want to try to summarize a couple of things that I've heard throughout the, throughout the conversation with people. Um, you know, this, this conversation is really about, is, it's, it's about the tools, right? That's, that's how we, we frame this. And I think that while oftentimes people walk away, okay, I got five tools, like I've got them right here, I'm gonna pull it out and I'm gonna use this tool here. There's, it's much more complex than that, right? The way in which we engage in dialogue is much more complex. We really have to think about preparation and preparation begins with self-care. We have to think about safety, our physical, our emotional safety. We have to think about self-love, about how we're loving and caring for ourselves, how we're loving and caring for each other. We have to identify the situation that we're in and what we're, what we're going into. Are we going into a situation with students, with faculty, with staff, mixed company, with family? Where are we going? Um, does the situation require mediation school skills? Does it require conflict de-escalation skills? Does it require um, that we separate people? Does it require nonviolent skills? Uh, I've heard people invoke on this conversation, does it involve violence? Um, does it involve dialogic skills? Does it involve healing skills, right? There are so many different sets of skills and we really have to think about that. Dialogue is a word that we've started using now as a blanket statement, as a synonym for, synonym for conversation. Um, that's not necessarily the case, right? Dialogue and, and you know, difficult dialogue, uh, sustained dialogue, intergroup dialogue are particular modes and methods and ways that we engage with one another. There are particular tools within those methods that we use. And so we have to define our situation. We have to define what skills we need to use in order to engage. I think another th piece that we, uh, we haven't quite named, but I think is important to call out is, is also practice, right? We can't engage in a conversation once and think we're going to be expert at it. We have to practice. And so if this is your first, if this is going to be your first engagement in a dialogue or a conversation, you, you may need to call in for help and we need to know when to ask for help. That's a tool we can use as well. Uh, we can ask for help. We can ask for a co-facilitator in addition. We can think about strategies to slow ourselves down. And even in slowing down, we sometimes realize what tools we need and we learn how to define the situation. Um, and we can understand what it is and what tool is needed to move forward. We can think about how we build common ground with one another. We know we're going to enter into a conversation that's gonna be really challenging. And we have to think about how we defy the possibilities within that conversation. We have to think about, we have to, again, create that some a radical imagination to think about something new, something different that we haven't thought about or imagined before. And I think we also, we have to have care with one another and ourselves throughout the conversation. And we have to think about the post, what happens after the conversation? How are we wrapping it up? How are we caring for one another? And with that, that ties into where we are now, as we are wrapping up our series and wrapping up our conversation today, this is not it. That is a beautiful thing about dialogue is that there's an opportunity to come back, to continue, to engage, to say, oops, I forgot that, let's add more, and to continue to build and grow together. And so along those lines, as I started, please engage with us, engage with the panelists, engage with myself, um, engage with the DDNRC, Princeton, Wash U, we are here to, we've created a community and we wanna continue building that community and continue building the resources 
and the conversation with one another. For the next couple of months, it may look like a series of blogs that we have developed and videos that are going to be popping up over the next several weeks on the website. So we urge you to join the listserv and you will receive access to that information. And um, let us know what you want to see in the future and we will do our best to, to meet those needs. So uh, in closing, I'm going to pitch it to our panelists. Is there one little statement, final closing thoughts that you would like to like to share? And it could just be a thank you too, <laughs> or see you soon. For me, it will be a thank you to everyone on the panel, to you, Bridget, of course, for beautiful moderation and to Mark also, the people all behind us, behind the yeah. scenes who are supporting this and who planned it, the people who came, you are awesome. We need you in the world in any direction. And a specific shout out to Erica. Erica, you're awesome. I know we are frustrating and for all the right reasons, uh, we are with you more than you know. Um, go get them, we are behind you. Thanks, Libby. I'd love to ditto what Libby said and jump in here now because I want Erica to have the last word. And, <laughs> and I'm just, as I'm sitting here, I'm reminded of um, Jimmy Baldwin and his sentiments that hope is something that we invent every day. And there's a reason why I think it needs to be reinvented every day um, because it's crushed by the end of the last day. So um, if, we're, if we're experiencing getting to the end of each day, feeling like our hope has been crushed, you're in good company and you choose how you reinvent your hope for the next day. Thanks, Roger. Um, thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you for including me in this conversation, Bridget, and everybody that was a part of this. And like incredibly grateful for all the work that you all have done like day in and day out because we learn on the shoulders of you all. So I'm really incredibly grateful. Well, I will echo that thanks and close us out. Thank you all for your time, your energy, your dedication. We are incredibly grateful to those on the panel, those behind the scenes and those of you who attended. So have a great evening or afternoon wherever you are about the world. All right, take care everyone. <laughs>